tonight's meeting on uh, December the 3rd, Friday, we have a guest speaker by the name of Blair Healy. And Blair has a 404 that has had extensive work done upon it by a number of practitioners around Australia so that he can participate in a very special rally in Argentina and Peru and Bolivia called uh, Back to the Incas or something like that. And uh, I uh, certainly hope that you enjoy his talk as I'm sure the rest of the members who are present here tonight, and there's about 35, which is a really good turn up. Um, and, and, I, and I wish you all have to have a very Merry Christmas as well. Um, somebody came and told me about this very unusual rally, which suddenly I, I really wanted to do, actually. And it was called the, um, the Peking to Paris Rally. Um, and, and that, um, I've got a book here, in fact, you can have a look at this, this after if you like. It was a rally that was first done in uh, uh, 1907 by a Italian prince. And, um, and there were four vehicles on the rally. Um, three of them were like uh, the old style, uh, a Bugatti and a Talia. Um, and the fourth vehicle actually was like a, a French three um, wheeled motorcycle. And it took them about uh, six months to actually get from Peking to Paris or Beijing to Paris. Um, and the, the event was pretty well document, documented and um, a, a company in England called the ERA, the Endurance Rally Association, restarted that rally in uh, 2007. Um, um, and um, from 2007 onwards, they roughly run the rally every, every three or four years. I heard about it in about 2013 and told my wife, I want to go on that rally and we've got to get a car to go on that rally. And, um, and that's where the, I guess, the journey of, of Pedro actually started, of, of wanting to do that, um, that Peking to Paris rally. Now, I'm gonna go through a presentation now, but I, I'd really like to say I, I'd like it as informal and as open as possible. So as I go along, if anybody wants to interrupt and ask a question, or say, bullshit, Blair, that, uh, <laughs> that's not correct, uh, please, please stop me. Uh, because I know a lot of people will sort of look at the car and say, uh, that's not a 404 when they look at some of the things I've done to the car. Um, so, uh, so please feel free to say that and, and put me in my place. Um, so this presentation is about uh, this uh, special 404 that we called um, Pedro. Um, Pedro obviously being Spanish, South America being a very Spanish country, we thought it was an appropriate name uh, for the car and it rhymed with Peugeot. <laughs> So why a 404? Uh, this was around 2013 or, and, and 14, and I was trying to work out, um, I'm not a car man, by the way. Um, uh, I, I, um, I really wanted to do this, this Peking to Paris rally, and I wanted to find a car to do it that, that would be competitive, and I wouldn't have to spend all my time under the car and doing it. So um, I asked around and I um, heard of this guy called uh, uh, Matt Bryson um, in Sydney. Um, he, his father was a famous navigator in, the, um, in, in rallying and had done the, the, uh, the Melbourne, uh, sorry, the, the London to Sydney marathon, a, a number, in fact, twice. And uh, for whatever reason, they put me on this guy called uh, uh, Matt Bryson. And I said I wanted to do the Peking to Paris. He'd already done, he'd done the Peking to Paris um, uh, three times by the time I'd got to him. And he'd won it twice with a guy called Jerry Crown. Um, and therefore, you know, in, in my view and people around him said, if anybody can find a car that will success, successfully do like the Peking to Paris or a, a long distance endurance rally, it's this guy called Matt Bryson. He, he's won it twice and he actually built the car. Him and Jerry Crown actually used a, um, a P76, you know, the Leyland P76, and, and he built this car, and, and twice they, um, they did it. The Peking to Paris is a very competitive race. 
Um, normally there's about 100 cars in it and it's a vintage and classic uh, race. So cars from about the 1920s all the way up till the, about 1973 can compete in the race and effectively they have two to um, um, uh, um, if you like divisions, one is is the um, the the classic cars and the um, or or pre World War Two if you like and post World War Two. Um, when I met Matt, I asked him what sort of you know what cars would he suggest to actually do the peaking to Paris and um, or another rally which we were starting to talk about at the time, which was the Incas. And he gave me three options. He said, these would be the best three cars if you want to enjoy the rally and not spend too much time under the car. Uh, there was a Peugeot 404, which is, and he showed me the car. It's the top left-hand corner. He had this car in his uh, little area there, the, the old uh, black Peugeot there. Um, he had a, an old uh, Volvo Amazon, if you're familiar with that car, which is a sort of similar era car. And he also had a, a Mitsubishi Lancer. And he said, if, if you allow me to modify one of these cars, I can, um, you know, I can make sure you could finish something like Peking to Paris successfully or the Incas Rally. My wife was with me and she said, I like the look of that car, which was the black Peugeot. Uh, and to be quite honest, that's how we selected uh, the Peugeot. After that, I started to do some research there. So my wife had already selected the car. I said, shit, I hope, you know, she selected a, a, a good one. So one of you's got good taste. Yeah, <laughs> my wife, exactly. Yeah. Okay, she's not here this evening and she would uh, certainly agree with you. Um, so why a Peugeot 404? Uh, and when I started to read about it, I said, shit, my wife has got good taste. Um, or good judgment, if you like. Because the Peugeot 404, as you know, all you would be aware, it's, it's a very light, sturdy, a pen and freedom monocoque design, um, you know, very famous design actually, very classic design, and I think it was one of uh, the first, uh, uh, you know, early uh, 60s, mono, like complete monocoque um, design. Uh, it was uh, uh, relatively inexpensive and parts were available. I think up, uh, I read at the time up until I think the 1990s, it was the most manufactured car around the world. Uh, Peugeot had sub-licensed manufacture of the car in South America, in Africa and a few other countries around the world. And I think up until the, uh, the early 90s, something like over 2 million cars had been produced, more than any, uh, any other car type. Uh, so that was... Some, some good news. Um, I also learned out, uh, getting on to uh, YouTube, it had been very successful in rallying. It was a very successful rally car in its day. Um, it was very versatile. You could fit a number of different types of engines, gearbox, and you could do quite a bit with the car. So, perfect uh, 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 product to start with. Um, uh, so what we did is, uh, Matt said, listen, um, you know, we're not going to use that uh, car you can see on the top left-hand uh, corner there. There was a, um, uh, the guy who ran the Peugeot garage, which was his good friend in Hornsby, New South Wales, a guy called Simon, um, uh, I'll think of his name, his, his, Simon? Riley. Riley, well done. Simon Riley. 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 Uh, uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, Simon Riley. His father actually had started, I think, the Peugeot uh, garage in Hornsby in, I think, about 1953 or 54. Um, and he had uh, uh, a, a Peugeot uh, garage uh, <coughs> since then. And his son Simon took it over, um, you know, I'm guessing in around about 2000. And um, and he and Simon did most of the uh, the work on the car with with Matt Bryson, the the guy who'd spent you know uh, time rallying, if you like, peaking to Paris and building uh, P seventy sixes with some of his advice in terms of you know what was to be done with the car. Um, but fundamentally, we uh, we bought Simon Riley's car, which he'd done a number of um, you know uh, uh, rallies in. And we also bought um, that car there, um, which Damien, I think you know where that car came from. He was at the cot with you, actually, and he's working on the cot. Uh, and he was a Peugeot Club member in Sydney, and he'd done a few rallies in that car. Um, and, and fundamentally, Pedro, if you like, is really was, was built on the bottom uh, uh, right-hand 404. 
Um, so we had the right material to start with, uh, some really good 404s, three of them. So uh, we sat down, we thought about what, you know, how can we make a really good strong rally car, not only for, well, my ultimate aim was to do the peak into Paris, but uh, my wife had convinced me um, she didn't like collect camping. Peking to Paris is like um, 35 days and there's about 10 days camping um, uh, in Mongolia and Russia uh, when it gets very cold and very uncomfortable. So she convinced us to do the, uh, the Incas rally in, uh, in 2016. So we applied to do that. And uh, we then started thinking about how do we prepare uh, uh, the 404 for endurance rally. Um, I know Matt Bryson knows uh, Bill um, and actually uh, called Bill, spoke with Bill about his experience in rallying the 404. And, um, and as a result of those discussions and Matt looking at his own experience and talking to Simon Riley, uh, we decided to do a number of things with the 404. Please interrupt me and ask any questions too about the preparation of the car. But fundamentally, uh, we completely stripped the car down. In fact, I end up, I end up working in Sydney myself part-time uh, for six months with Simon Riley in his garage as his like apprentice and helping him pull the car down and prepare the car. So we completely stripped the car, uh, removed um, all the, the rust and what have you, and installed like a CAMS uh, type design uh, roll cage in it. Um, uh, we also uh, uh, strengthened the, uh, the chassis at, um, at certain points and particularly around the points where we put in a, a, uh, an MCO or a Murray Coote Australia suspension. If you're not familiar with Murray Coote Australia, he's a, a Queenslander just north of Brisbane and he makes world-class rally suspensions. Uh, uh, rally drivers around the world go to Murray uh, to uh, have a custom designed uh, suspension for their rally cars and uh, this was a suggestion of Matt so we went to to um, to Murray Coote and um, gave him all the dimensions of the you know the, the spring um, um, uh, uh, sus the spring uh, suspension of the um, the Peugeot and he he made a um, strengthened uh, spring and shock absorber suspension which he sent after about a month um, which we were able to, um, to install. We had the car repainted. I've got Arctic white up there. It's not Arctic white, it's Alpine white. was the original colour. Um, we looked at engines, um, and I think this is what built. We, we got the, um, the XN6. Was that one of yours? No, it wasn't. Okay, anyhow, um, it might have been Simon then. Simon suggested, you know, the, um, the XN6 uh, 505 engine is a very good engine, very strong block, can't break it. Um, and we had that, uh, Simon actually completely uh, stripped that engine down and rebuilt it, but we had uh, uh, new forged pistons. Uh, we had uh, forged pistons made for the block. Um, and... Um, also uh, heavy duty sort of um, engine mounts around the block. Um, gearbox uh, was the, the Peugeot um, uh, BA75 gearbox, uh, which, you know, again, uh, somebody said was, was well matched to the, the engine and would be like very reliable and, um, and would be the right sort of gearbox for the configuration we're looking at. We ended up putting um, a, a custom um, manifold in because we were going to put in two um, uh, OER uh, 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 carburetors or OER are basically the same as um, um, Weber basically they're like a Japanese look-alike and I think they're pretty much the same carburetor from what I understand but anyway we put in two um, uh, side draft 45mm um, uh, carburetors um, but we actually had to make our own manifold okay and as you can see here the uh, the manifold pipes now we had no idea at that time if we most probably spoken to somebody here they might have told us well listen there's an off-the-shelf um, uh, manifold we we weren't aware of that at that time so Simon said this we'll have to make our own manifold and the manifold we made the length of those manifold pipes were initially 160 millimeters 
Um, and when we put them on the car, um, it, it, uh, it just wasn't right. So we just started to um, actually cut the manifold down until we felt it was sort of right. And I think we ended up coming down to about from 120 to 50 millimeter, like re-welding every time. And then we end up those, uh, the, um, uh, you can see the, the pipes there. We, we actually end up shortening those substantially, actually, before we thought we had the right sort of power and so on in the car. Um, and we also put in a much larger radiator. Now you can see the pictures there, I guess that's in, in Simon's um, uh, garage there during the strip down. There's the, uh, the engine that he completely pulled down and we put the new um, uh, 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 manifold on. And um, there's a picture there of it sort of all fully installed, ready to start. As I said, we, um, uh, I don't know how many times we had to go back and cut that down, like we started at 120 and then went down to 100 and then went down to 80 and uh, just went down into increments until we thought, you know, it, it felt right. I'll take a pause there and ask whether there's any questions or anyone is, what, want to say, Blair, that's bullshit. <laughs> yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. The manifold that you show in that photograph, the length that you finished with? No, that was the length we started with, actually. Okay. Um, and um, so that's 120 mil there, and we end up cutting that down to, um, I think we end up with, with about 50 or 60 mil, so we end up halving it. Yeah, yeah, it, it ended up coming, which, which was great for the, the air filters, which actually go on the end of those, those pipes, because yeah. even there we had trouble filtering uh, or fitting in the, um, the air filters. Room on the side for a six inch at least. Yeah. Clean them. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, All good? Okay, I'm struggling with exactly the same thing at the moment. Yeah. yeah no, and we felt the 50 to 60 mil was, was about the right length of, of the manifold. Does anybody know anything about that? Can anybody comment on that? I'm just interested myself, actually, to, to, to learn about this because we're still trying to get the optimum length of the manifold, yeah? If you're quoting the length of manifold, you should be quoting the length from the back of the barrel. Is that right, is it? So okay. You get a piece of uh, wire, run it down so it touches the back of the barrel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Pull it out, find that curve, measure how long it is. Yeah. And then for any particular RPM that you're trying to target, yeah. peak power at, there is a length of manifold that's ideal. Is that right, and yeah? A, there are several books published on... <laughs> is that okay? It's, so it's all, it's all about wave cycles and, and, right. and matching the length of... The yes. Uh, the, the frequency and the amplitude of the it, measure it, well. is, is that right too? So it relates to your cam and so for every combination of valve size camshaft there's an inlet and rpm there's an inlet length that's perfect this, and that's everything optimal. else is a compromise is that right okay, <laughs> so okay. There, there are some there's, there's a bunch of rules of thumb on for example the gen v website has a really good rule of thumb of if you've got x rpm with x size engine right it's about whatever it is Okay. 100 millimetres, 200 millimetres. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the higher your RPM, the shorter your intake. Right. Okay. Did they discover that the TIs, when they used to race those, they actually increased the length of the inlet manifold? Well, so right. increasing it will tend to lower your, like, get your torque up and lower your peak horsepower. Yeah. But if what you're chasing is a really torquey engine, lengthening it out is often really good. Correct, yes, yeah, yeah, and, that, and that's what we found, that's why we wanted short, because we wanted the right compromise between, I guess, really torque and acceleration, yeah. Yeah, so there's, there's a balance between having an engine that will rev its tits off, yeah. but just have nothing down low, and right. vice versa. Okay. So I think it's about 12 inches from the valve to the end of the manifold. Right. But you adjust it using the trumpets on the carbies, not the manifold. Oh, can you do that, can you? So yeah. when you actually cut the trumpets back? Oh, you can buy different lengths. Oh, I guess you can. Yes, yeah, right, right, okay. <laughs> so it saves cutting and re-welding that. <laughs> it did, because uh, Simon had to do all the welding every time. We'd cut him back, and he'd re-weld it on, and we'd cut it back, and he'd re-weld weld it on. Okay. It would have been really pissed off if he had to actually start making it longer. <laughs> <laughs> well, we know. We did start with a long. We, 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 knew, we knew the issue that, that the gentleman there said, and we knew we'd have to start long. So we started long and then, then cut it back until we, we thought we got the right, the right length. Yep. Uh, to set your length, there are several books that have been published on the subject. It's purely organ type theory. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be a compromise because whatever length you put it 
that will give you peak torque at a different point in your rev range. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Peak torque's affected by your camshaft lift and timing. Yeah. And the length of the inlet. Right. So the best thing is to make the best guess, put it on the dyno and tune it to what you want yeah. for your road use. Yeah. And I'm interested that you run 45. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm building one at the moment for 40 mil DCOEs. Right. Because I'm looking for torque, not peak power. Right. Okay, good. Good. Yeah, no, we didn't run on the dyno. Fundamentally, what we did is when we cut it back, we just ran it around the block <laughs> and drove it. If it felt right, then... Uh, yeah, okay, good. Okay, so this is a little bit more on preparation. Um, we uh, removed the, um, uh, the, the, the lovely Peugeot seats and put it in, in racing seats and, and, and uh, seat belts. As I said earlier, we put in a Murray Coote Australia uh, a customised... Uh, suspension, which were like heavy duty shock absorbers and springs. Very, very, um, uh, uh, I guess, stiff suspension. But to be quite honest, you know, when we uh, uh, did the journey uh, through uh, South America, and I understand quite a few people that do the peaking to Paris, even though they might be overseas, uh, people from North America or Europe, they'll actually use the Murray Coot suspension because it, it just performs so well. It's pretty much, you know, unbreakable. Um, we upgraded the, uh, the, the well-known thing, the torsion bar at the back. I remember Bill, when we went and saw Bill, he said, that torsion bar's not going to work. Uh, you need a special uh, a strength and torsion so bar between the... So the, you mean the panhard rod? That yeah. The panhard rod, sorry, it's a panhard rod, yes. Yeah. Um, we put in a, uh, which you can see there, a picture of, uh, the aluminium um, uh, fuel tank, 85 litre uh, fuel tank with few, two fuel pumps, which I could switch over from the, the dash. Uh, just for redundancy, and and we we needed that uh, we we used that twice. Um, front disc brakes, um, uh, all the wheels. Of course, the four hundred four has three studded wheels. We converted all the the wheels to four studded wheels, and in fact, Colin Wes um, uh, Colin did that for me here in Melbourne. Um, he's gone home. He's gone home. <laughs> he's a real stayer, isn't he? <laughs> um, <laughs> We put bash plates all the way underneath the car at, you know, at the front, um, under the, the gearbox and also the worm diff. Um, I uh, put special plates under that. Um, obviously a Terra Trip Rally uh, uh, installed and I used the, the Dunlop Direza uh, tyres, the 185, 15, 65s, which were, were really good tyres actually, really good tyres. and that. That really uh, summarised the, um, the configuration. Um, because we had so many Peugeots, as you can see on the, the left-hand side, we just also got another, the console thing, and it's, it doesn't look like that. Now we've got a little bit more in there, but fundamentally, we just put another um, driver console on that, and it's put all the instrumentation on the left-hand side now, because we have a few other um, uh, uh, GPS navigation things and stuff like that for, um, for rallying. No. Um, the battery also went in the boot. We put the ba uh, uh, battery in the boot. Um, I have a comp car completely rewired, um, and in particular, um, you know, check for for earth. Everything was was really went through in terms of the earthing of the uh, electrical system. A guy really went through it. Did a really good job. Um, and so almost it was. It, it is sort of a 404. Now people can attack me now and say it's not a 404. But fundamentally, it had all the elements of a 404 and just trying to strengthen up. Like even the Murray Coote suspension, um, he still used, we had to set in the original shock absorbers and the springs. And fundamentally, all he really did is provide bigger, heavy duty shock absorbers and springs. These rallies, uh, these endurance rallies, the, the, the fundamental rule is that um, uh, whatever car you have, you can use the same technology that was available at the time. Um, and, and you can't overstep that technology except for the only exception they give basically is, is disc brakes. That all cars are entitled for safety reasons uh, uh, to put, if you like, uh, disc brakes on, on the front. And, and most cars do. And then if you put an engine, the engine must be of the same um, era or before that, that era, if you like. So you can't um, overstep the um, um, technology yeah. of, of that era, which, which we did. So in, in accordance with this, 
you know, I guess it's about a 40 page rule book in terms of what you can do to cars for these endurance rallies. Fundamentally, this, this ticked all the, um, the boxes in terms of meeting all the requirements. Claire, you said before you got a VA75 gearbox in it. Yeah. And the column shift was still there. No, it? no. <laughs> no, it's not. Sorry, that was before <laughs> the gearbox was put in. Oh, my apologies, though, Damien. Yes. No, it's okay. You can run a VA75. Oh, can you really? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, uh, it's just interesting to see. Has someone else done it? Like you? Right. No. <laughs> no. The gear shift came out soon after that, and it's a. Uh, it's on the floor. Yeah. Yes. Well, yeah, just a quick one. The um, regional fuel tank, how many litres did it hold? 56. Is it 50? Yeah, <laughs> yeah 56. Yeah, we, we had to have a range of, the, again, the, one of the rally requirements. So you have to have a range of at least 600 kilometres with the fuel tank and onboard fuel. So we ended up doing 85, or it's closer to 90, but it was between 85 and 90 litres, you know, when we did it out, and, and that got us 600 kilometres. We, we could get 65. Drive it carefully, I get 600 kilometres on that tank. What happens if you don't? Uh, you're in trouble. <laughs> pushing for a wee while. Yeah, you're pushing for a while, exactly, yeah. yeah. Okay, now the Incas Rally itself, okay? The Incas Rally was run from, um, as, as we heard, heard earlier, um, from about mid-November to mid-December 2016. It was held in South America. I actually had to prepare the car about four months before the rally. We had to actually, it went by sea from Melbourne um, via the, uh, the Panama Canal um, into Buenos Aires. And it was a three month uh, ship journey in a container. Um, the company that organized the rally, uh, 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 organised all that for us out, out of Melbourne, basically. Uh, the company was called the Endurance Rally Association. It's a, and it was an English uh, rally um, uh, company. There's a few companies in England that, that you know, the, the English um, and the Europeans love their rallies, love their cars. And, um, and every year, uh, there's hundreds of different types of rallies run throughout Europe. But the real rallies that guys really like to get involved in are these, these long distance rallies, or what they call the endurance rallies. Um, it was 12,000 kilometres from Buenos Aires um, to Lima. On the map there, you can see the journey starting in um, in Buenos Aires here, which we uh, got to, and then sort of went south um, uh, all the way down to the southern part of Argentina, which all this area down here is known as the Pampas, you know, where they raise, raise beef cattle. Um, and then we have to cross the Andes um, all the way up on the, uh, the coast of Chile and then back again across the Andes, uh, really crisscross the Andes through Argentina um, until we actually cross the border uh, near um, 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 oh, this country here. Bolivia. Sorry? Bolivia. Bolivia, well done. Bolivia, somebody knows his geography. Bolivia and then into, um, into Peru, to Lima. Um, the way the rally organisers done it, if you haven't done one and, and you ever get the opportunity to do one, if you want to see a country, this English company really did their homework. They did a wonderful job. Um, uh, every day we would travel yeah, on an average of 500 kilometres a day, but we'd, they would select the route through the best parts of the country in terms of things to see. And, um, but you wouldn't be travelling the main roadways. You'd be travelling on dirt tracks or four-wheel drive tracks. Um, and therefore, it was ideal. It was a, a great... Uh, you know, seeing the countryside and all the sights to see, plus there was a challenge of, of driving a car with, with, with competition with other people around you. So it was one of the best experiences I, I can think of that I had. Um, Were well, many of the roads actually closed to just the rally traffic? Um, in some cases they were, in some cases they weren't. They, 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 they should have been. Um, I, I can recall a story where we, we were having these time, speed, distance or regularity trials where we were, um, and it was very competitive. You know, there were 60 cars in my class or in the less than two litre classic car, car, car class. There was 20 cars and everybody, you know, guys from England and Australia, New Zealand, America, uh, Germany, the con everybody's got their own car and everybody's, you know, trying to win and, and have fun at the same time. I can remember this one particular trip where 
we, we were stopped there and it was a dirt road and I don't know, maybe it was around about 30 or 40 kilometers. And I was just about to take off and suddenly this big log truck goes by us, okay, dust everywhere. And I pleaded to the marshal, I said, listen, no, no, can we wait till that um, log truck clears? He said, yeah, okay then, but I'll, I'll only give you another minute. I said, wait a minute. And just before that minute, another log truck <laughs> came through. And uh, he said, no, this time, sorry, there's cars lined up behind you, so you've got to go. And we thought the road, well, he said, the road's open, but be careful. Okay, so I got the car, well, well we were in the car and we really started speeding anyhow. The second uh, log truck that went through, I sort of overtook dust and shit everywhere and on the, um, uh, uh, the road, couldn't see a thing, to be quite honest, um, uh, praying to God that no car was coming the other direction. And then we, um, uh, we met a school bus coming the other way. <laughs> so uh, my wife said after that, you can't overtake uh, 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 that sort of thing. So. Um, it was funny, the, the rally organisation in South America, um, what you did there, you wouldn't be able to get away with in a lot of countries, I think. And, and they did the, um, they just uh, sort of block off a road, um, 20 or 30 kilometres, and have one, pe people at one end and people at the other. And then occasionally, you know, like generally speaking, they were like dirt roads or something like that. So sometimes you didn't see a car, like a local car, uh, a South American car, or a school bus uh, at all, and other times you did. So, um, so it was an interesting part of the. Road. Nobody got killed on that rally. Nobody got um, injured or hurt, which was good. <laughs> were you driving on the right hand side or the left hand side? Um, we were driving on the um, the right hand side. Yeah. Okay, so you were effectively it was that was hard, made it harder as well. Yes, yeah, yeah. It did a little bit. Yes, yeah, yeah. It made it harder for my wife. No, <laughs> she no, was. No wonder your wife. She wasn't very happy at all. <laughs> I didn't mind. <laughs> Um, so the competition included what's called regularity, TSD, and, and um, you know, that's a time speed distance where it might be uh, uh, a track of around about 25, you all know what TSD is, yeah? Um, it's like people say that's, that's um, um, it's not that competitive, but to be quite honest, I, I found it like in, in, like one example that we had where we actually, it was a dirt road going up a hill, snaked up a hill, and it was 60 kilometres an hour was meant to be the average speed going up a hill, okay, for about, you know, I'm guessing 10, 12 kilometres. And you'd think that, you know, you'd be able to do that quite easily. But 60 kilometre hours going up a hill in a 404 is not easy. And I can remember having to take, um, there were cars, you know, there was a, a, a Merc, uh, there was a, a, a Volvo Amazon, and a, um, some Chevy, uh, 60 Chevys. I had to overtake going up to be quite honest on, on this track. And it's, it still was very challenging, even though people say, oh shit, it's only 60 kilometers an hour and it's only 12 kilometers, but it can be quite a, a challenging and sometimes quite dangerous drive is, is TSD and, and a lot of fun as well. Um, yeah, so there's the regularity. Um, South America, if you're not aware, has produced some of the world's greatest racing drivers. And when you drive through Argentina, Chile, and um, Peru, nearly every place we stopped at every day, there was a driving track there, like a, a, a V8 supercars driving track, you know, three, five kilometers, like a serious sort of racing track. And um, this rally organization had organized us to race on these tracks every, t every town we went to. So every day, uh, well, nearly every day, we had a, a racing track where we'd be timed around the track. Um, and that counted towards your points. So there was time, speed, distance competition. There was a racing track competition. Basically, it was just purely based on the fastest car around the track. Sometimes we'd do one lap, sometimes we'd do two laps. And these, these tracks would be like, let's say, sand down. Uh, they, were, they were very good tracks and, you know, you know well, well, um, well, well made tracks. And the third thing was um, navigation to their destination. We'd have to check out in the morning and check out a certain time and then you even taking into account you, you might have to stop along the way and do two or three TSDs um, and then during that day you'd also do a race track uh, you'd have to be in by a certain time in the evening and if you weren't in by that time in the evening you would be penalized so effectively those three competitions during each day um, you you then start to aggregate your points if you like for the whole um, for the whole rally.
and, and that was added up. Every day you'd see where you were sitting, if you like, in the pack of um, um, this particular rally. Um, the other thing about the rally, um, we, you know, in Australia, we, we, we love our country and think it's, it's, it's great and there's a lot of interesting things to see and do. But one of the, and I've, I've travelled throughout Australia, I've travelled around Australia three or four times, I've been through the centre, I've been across, I was in the army, I, I took an expedition once across the Great Sandy Desert, Tenamai Desert, I've been across nearly every part of Australia you can. But I would say one of the best experiences I've ever had is the Andes in South America. Uh, the Andes are, are a range that runs down the, um, uh, the, the western coast there, uh, uh, anywhere, I, I think that the highest is around about six, six and a half thousand metres, you know, uh, 22,000 feet, something like that. But they're a very fascinating range. Um, um, and, and we saw all of it. Uh, parts of it are volcanic. Uh, parts of it are tropical, uh, parts of it are uh, snow-capped mountains in the summer and these beautiful high altitude lakes. Parts of it are desert. You've most probably all heard of the Atacama Desert, uh, a high uh, level, um, uh, a high altitude desert where almost nothing lives. Um, it was just so fascinating. And, and the beauty of this rally, as you can see when we're in Argentina, going here from um, San Juan, Whoops, sorry, going back. Uh, from San Juan there, we, we crossed the Andes like three or four times going back and forth. The highest mountain pass we went through was 4,800 metres, or roughly 15,000 feet, which is the height of base camp in, um, in Everest. Um, and, and one of the reasons why we end up uh, using the, the OER or, or Weber carbs they actually come with um, jets, uh, adjustable, not adjustable jets, but jets with different size um, holes in them. So we had to had three types of jets, and obviously the higher you got in altitude, uh, the uh, the richer the um, uh, uh, mixture became, and therefore you had to use a narrower jet to um, lean down the mixture. And, and we would do that when we were climbing through um, um, altitude. So um, uh, like on the, on the Pampers, I used uh, one type of jet. And as we climbed up through the Andes up to 3,000 uh, metres, I'd, I'd start to um, you know, put the different jets in. And even with the, the narrowest jet at 4,800 uh, metres, uh, you couldn't take your foot off the pedal. Uh, because if, you, if, if the car stalled, it was very, very hard to start. Very hard to start. Um, so the, the rally, there was about 64 vintage and classic cars on it. Um, the oldest car, which is an interesting car, was a, a 45 litre 1925 Bentley, which is the old sort of open top Bentley, a beautiful car. Yeah, I'm guessing half a million dollar car, beautiful car. And this guy had completely restored it uh, for the, um, an English guy, had completely restored it for the rally. The youngest car, was a 7.2 litre 1973 Jensen Interceptor Series 3. Um, uh, that's about a seven or $800,000 car. Um, this guy was a diplomat from, um, from Switzerland and he, I think it's got about an eight or nine speed gearbox. The car was on a truck bed day three. The guy screwed the car. Actually, um, uh, this, you know, wise, uh, it was interesting, the rally, prior to doing the rally, they, they sent you a book explaining all the rules and all the modifications you had to do to the, the car, even basic things like having, um, you know, mud flaps and making sure, you know, you've got as much height as possible, uh, 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 bash plates under the car, uh, long range fuel tanks, or if you haven't carry extra fuel, um, you know, make sure you've got spare shock absorbers and get somebody to get... This guy had done nothing <laughs> to this car, so he started the rally, shipped his car from Switzerland with this uh, Jensen in Interceptor, and uh, it was the, the uh, you know, I, I thought it was almost funny, but also quite sad. This guy, um, uh, I don't think he destroyed it, but literally he, um, uh, he drove it like, you know, I was driving the Peugeot, for example, um, you know, um, which had been very well prepared, whereas this guy had done nothing to his car at all. But, um, and he ended up doing the rest of the rally in a, uh, a higher car.
faster. Uh, yeah, no, he went faster, yeah. So what, that size, was, what size tank have you had? If, the, an engine, if you had an engine that size, what size fuel tank would you have? I, I, I'm not sure, to be quite honest. Uh, not sure. Yeah, it's a beautiful looking car, though. When I saw it, I uh, and all the cars were lining up there at the start of the rally. Uh, you know, I I thought it was like somebody had just bought a car to uh, to be there with everybody else staying the rally. That, that somebody in Buenos Aires had this you know beautiful Jensen intercept and, and decided to come down and uh, just have a look at all the other car, the older cars that were there. But no, this guy was 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 on the rally, and he put his stickers on the side of the car. I said, "Gee, why would you, why would you do that to such a beautiful car?" But anyhow, he did. You know. I think the uh, the Jensen Interceptor was a four wheel drive. Was it? Yeah. That's what I, that's what I believe to be. Right. It was, it was a four wheel yeah, drive. Solution. Yeah. Most of them are. Though. Was it? Yeah. And what? I know, like day one, he I, I, it was about an eight speed gearbox. Was it an automatic gearbox he had on? Eight speed? I don't know. Oh, okay. Anyhow, I know from day. I think he broke it on day three or four, or day three or four of the um, the rally. But on day two, he only had. Um, like two or three gears on it. Um, so he, he screwed the gearbox on the, 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 the second or third day of the, uh, the rally. And that was one of his biggest issues was the gearbox. He, he had a lot of troubles with that. And nobody, like, I can remember him taking it to the various places we went through Argentina, asking uh, the local mechanic shops uh, whether they would look at it. And, you know, they'd never seen a car like that before uh, or a gearbox like that before. Surprising because it's surprising. So it's, it's a, a gearbox. is it it's right? Gearbox. Yeah. If so it's an FF. Yeah. It would have been extremely long. Um, four forty cubic inch, seventy three. I have a Jensen interceptor. I know a lot about them. Right. It's a hundred and ten liter fuel tank. FF. Is it okay? And the how many gears are in the automatic gearbox? Three speed. Oh no! But this he must have had a different gearbox because he had about eight. It was eight or nine gears he had in it. Uh, yeah. Uh, does it make sense, though? No? That's what it's top. No, very, very basic. Yeah. The front end was Jaguar. The rest of the car was Chrysler. Right, OK. I'm very surprised it couldn't be a car sport. Yeah. OK, um, I guess this is a bit of a, uh, a tourist... Uh, like we, um, in Argentina, uh, you can see some of the cars lined up um, there. Um, the again, uh, these rallies were extremely well organised. The, the first day, uh, we'd uh, uh, done some driving and we'd, we'd done a, a racetrack and done a couple of laps and times around a, a racetrack. And then we went to uh, Argentina's famous for its beef cattle and their cowboys they call gauchos. So we pulled up this beautiful big ranch where they showed us the horsemanship, if you like, of the local gauchos and cowboys and also put on their, uh, their best beef ribs, Argentinian style, in a large open barbecue. And it was a, a really great, I remember the day very clearly, it was a really great way to start the rally. Um, the only disappointing thing at lunchtime, of course, no alcohol. <laughs> so we had this beautiful meal, but uh, couldn't enjoy a good glass of um, Argentinian wine. Um, I'm sure you've all heard of Juan Fianjo, the um, uh, famous Argentinian um, uh, uh, Formula One driver. Um, prior to Formula One, he was a, um, a bit of a, like a road driver in, um, in Argentina, and he's a real legend in Argentina. And just south of Buenos Aires, we actually went to the Fangio Museum, which is the building you can see in this picture up here, a, a building dedicated to him with all these... Um, you know, wonderful um, uh, cars in it. We pulled all the cars up the, at, at the front of the uh, museum and um, that's me and my wife there with a, a, a Fangio's uh, a, a Chrysler. Um, interestingly, uh, a guy who was on the rally who had a bit of money um, actually had a barn find of a Fangio in the US somewhere, or at least so he said, and he rebuilt it, uh, which is... That, that car, if you like, next to Pedro in the service station there, and he ended up coming first in the, um, the vintage car, um, uh, or oh, sorry, not vintage car, but in his class, in his, uh, his Fangio.
Um, when we were driving around um, Argentina, coming to the south of Argentina, we went through this place called Esquel. I was driving down and then suddenly somebody actually tried to run, coming in the other direction, run me off the road. Um, and uh, he almost succeeded and we pulled over and it was uh, a Peugeot 404. <laughs> uh, a, a local guy, couldn't speak a zip of, of English, I can't speak Spanish, but he, we had an interpreter there and uh, he had, as you can see, the 404, the beautiful uh, 404, which was in mint condition. There are a lot of 404s actually made in Argentina. They had a license to make them and they used them, I think, for taxis up until the 1990s. Um, but his car, uh, he, through the interpreter, his uh, father, sorry, his grandfather bought that car in the 60s, late 60s, um, and his grandfather gave it to his, his um his father and his father gave it to him. So it had been in the family since it was bought and it was the pride and joy of his whole life and existence. Uh, and he followed us around, we we're only there for a day, he followed us around everywhere and we had a, a really good time. So, um, but he, he was just blown away by another Peugeot that looks sort of exactly like, uh, exactly like his. I think in Buenos Aires, they still race four or fours on the track. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Uh, the biggest competition apparently is the Fair 1500. Is that right? Yeah. yeah there's a lot, lot of. Flight yeah, in fact, we, we saw like in fields, we'd often, yeah, and people would often send me texts saying, listen, Blair, if you need parts, we just saw a 404 in the field over there. Um, there were quite a few we, we, we saw around, yeah. yeah. Have a look at the 404 Facebook page in, in uh, Buenos Aires or Argentina, and you see lots and lots of information. But they're quite keen on doing them up. There's a lot of little shit boxes as well. Yeah. 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 Claire, sorry. Yep. Mm -hmm. Now, without him sounding insulting, yep. which one is which one is you? Oh, <laughs> I'm on the right. You're on the right. Yeah. He's mm -hmm. a tall bloke. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we run over somebody. You can tell by the bond. Um, every day was a new adventure. Every day was different. There was one day where uh, there was one route we had to do, which was again up in the Andes on a dirt road, which is around about 150 k. Um, but they put the whole day aside for it. It had rained like quite a bit uh, a few days um, before this stretch we had to do and initially they were going to say no we're going to cancel it's too much water on the road and the creeks were flooded so yeah they said let's do it anyhow it was a real uh, a real challenge that's not the worst it was just a, a complete quagmire um, anyhow you end up uh, pairing up with people and uh, that's my beautiful wife next to the Persia but behind that actually is a 1955 a Citroen and we paired up with a guy called Mario Illion. And Mario Illion actually was one of the founders of Mercedes AMG. And he uh, uh, was an engine designer and today runs a consultancy out of um, uh, Switzerland where he does Formula One uh, engine and powertrain design. Uh, he's a Swiss engineer, he's about um, a 70. And him and his wife were in the car behind us. So we tick tag and I had no trouble in, um, he, um, uh, he built that car himself, uh, the, uh, well, built it from the ground up, if you like, including the engine, the gearbox and everything. And it was a beautiful sounding uh, uh, 1955 um, Citroen. Um, a light 15? Uh, pardon? It would have been a light 15. A late 15, is light, that? Light, light 15. 15, is that what it is, is it? Yeah. Anyhow, he, he thought that was the perfect car for this sort of rally. I had no trouble. I, in fact, I I pulled him uh, up the hill many, many times in the Persia, <laughs> uh, much to his disgust. Um, uh, but it was a, like his car was a beautiful car, but it most probably wasn't, I don't know, it just didn't perform very well in the mud. Yeah, I don't know front, why. Front wheel drive as well. Ah, okay. Well, maybe that was it, yeah. Yeah, but anyhow, uh, we are very good friends today, and I uh, you know, talk to him quite regularly, and he's still you know, designing engines for, um, he was at a, a time with Honda, Formula One Honda, and now I think he's with, um, uh, he might be back with Mercedes. Um, but it's just interesting the people you, you meet on these rallies and how much effort and how much they, they love, love their cars. And this, you know, I'll be, I think I spent about maybe um, you know, quite a bit of money on, on that, but uh, on, on our car. But Mario's car, he said, was maybe 300,000 euros is what he spent on, on that um, car. Yeah, it, it's a mid, I know it's a mid 50s uh, car, but he, he wanted everything on it. Um, what did you spend on yours? 
how much I spent on mine. I'll be honest, it was it, it was less than a hundred thousand um, dollars. So it wasn't too much at all, really. Uh, I think at the end of the day. <laughs> when I when I went to the insurance and asked them to insure it for actually the amount of money I spent. They said there's no way in the world a Peugeot 4 or 5 is, is worth that amount. I went to a number of different insurance companies and the maximum I could get it insured for was $40,000. What company was that with? Um, Shannon's or? Shannon's, it was Shannon's, yes. Shannon's Insurance, yeah. What was the premium of $40,000? Oh, I, I forget, I forget to be quite Shannon's or Lumley's, that's it. Yeah, yeah, you know, Shannon's, not, not, uh, Shannon's uh, insured, yeah. Um, so that, you can't see that sign, but that sign says uh, uh, Bolivia, um, Peru and Accra, which is a, a town in um, Peru which we were going, going through. And that was a high altitude pass um, in the Andes uh, driving into, into Peru. Crossing the Andes. As I said earlier, uh, it, it, to me it was one of the best experiences I, I think I've had and you know, we, we're very proud and we, we often uh, espouse our, our beautiful you know, landscapes here in Australia. I would say anybody that gets the opportunity to travel through the Andes, um, it's really well worth doing. Great roads, um, it's, they're quite poor countries. It was interesting, one of the things we noticed in countries where you'd see um, people in mud huts without doors and windows, there uh, always on the mud hut there was a like a solar PVV array and there were kids on the road with mobile phones. Um, so uh, uh, you, even though they're very poor, they seem to understand, if you like, the importance of communication and mobile phones. And we, we, we saw that everywhere. Uh, it was just one thing that just stood out where it, it was stark poverty, but at least you could afford a solar PV charger and a mobile phone. Um, the, the Andes had four passes over 4,500 metres, and they were, some of them were very challenging uh, passes. I forget how many switchbacks were in one of them, but it was, it's in, considered, when you Google it, it's considered one of the, 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 like the worst roads or the most difficult roads in the world to drive. And it's not so much difficult in the sense that um, uh, to physically drive it, but there's trucks and other cars on it, um, both going up and down all the time. It was more um, competing with the other traffic on the road and not overheating your car, you know, uh, getting up the mountain because, you know, you were stuck behind a, a large uh, truck that you just couldn't pass. Um, the highest pass was 4,800 metres, which I said earlier is about 15,000 feet, basically the height of base camp in Everest. So what do you do if your car starts to overheat? Um, we would just uh, pull over, to be quite honest. And to be honest, the Peugeot never overheated. Uh, I never had an issue. Even though the temperature got up there, we were always watching it, and I had a, a special like over-temperature light put on it. It, um, it never, the over-temperature light um, that you know, Simon put on never Never, never. Well, I assume it worked. It never went red, <laughs> and it kept on going. So. You had an oversized radiator. Yeah, I had an oversized radiator. Yeah, uh, uh, it it wasn't the original 404 radiator. It was a slightly um, larger radiator, similar to um, the white Peugeot. I'm just trying to find the gentleman now in the uh, the audience who's got that lovely uh, Peugeot with the the red uh, stripes on it. Ah, uh, yeah, it was a, I think it was a 505 radiator he he put on it. Yeah, it looked like a very similar radiator to yours. Yeah, I just had my 404 radiator, the original one, recalled a couple of days ago. Right. So I think. With the hot weather, it's working at about the limit of what I what it can kill. Right. You'll find out on Sunday if you drive it down. Not today. It's going to be done on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> But the, the engine, I think to me that engine was just a very reliable, um, you know, like good engine. It, it uh, We never had any issues or anything with it. I, I've just put a map up here just to show you. Um, this was actually crossing between place called Cusco. Cusco is actually up in the Andes and I think you've all heard of Machu Picchu, mm -hmm. you know, that, that famous uh, ruin that's that's up in the Andes um, that, you know, people find um, it's hard to explain how they built this uh, fortress, this, uh, uh, I'll show some pictures later of the fortress. Um, 
that's right up in uh, Cusco is about 3,500 um, meters. Uh, anybody on the rally that smoked actually had to have oxygen bottles. Uh, they walked around with small oxygen bottles because of the, uh, the altitude issues with breathing. Um, and um, we uh, drove from Cusco, um, which is on the, uh, if you like, the center of Peru, right across the Andes. Um, um, and um, we had to do 800 kilometers in one day. And the route was like, like this. So we started at about five o'clock in the morning and we finished about eight or nine o'clock in the evening. But it was one of the best drives I've ever done. Uh, we really, it was um, a tarmac road all the way. Um, pretty narrow road in some areas, and that's this is one of the um, the, the, the cars here. Where there's a, uh, an Australian in front of me in a in an uh, early 60s uh, Austin Healey, um, and then another uh, Englishman in his um, MG, and then it was another Australian, a South Australian in his uh, Mercedes. Um, that we we basically sort of supported one another uh, most of the journey, but. You know, this sort of indicates you know how um, uh, twisted and contorted the, the roads were. But it was was you know great fun to drive, great fun to drive because, not, um, unlike most parts of um, South America, we drove through there are always large cars and trucks, and particularly mining trucks on the road. Uh, whereas for whatever reason, between Cusco and NASCAR, um, you might have heard of the NASCAR lines. You know those large. Um, images in the desert uh, where you have to you know, get up to 5,000 feet to see it. There's uh, images uh, made of stone of, of eagles and turtles and all these unusual things. That's called the NASCAR lines. That's where we, we went to. Um, but the, the road between uh, Cusco and NASCAR, mm -hmm. eight, roughly 800 or 700 and something kilometres, almost 800 kilometres, there were very few uh, trucks or other vehicles on the road. So it was a, was a great day's driving. What fuel like? Yeah. A bigger pardon? What was fuel like? Uh, fuel was, was a big issue, actually. Um, and we always, again, um, we tune the car or we set up the car so we could take up to, I think it was down to, in South America they actually go down to, is it might be 85 RON? Is it 85? Um, R-O-N? Um, you know, like the normal petrol you get here is, uh, you know, the lowest grade of standard is, is 90 and then it's 95. I think the highest RON you get is 98, yeah. which is an indication of the amount of... Um, uh, anyhow, it's, it's an indication of the quality of fuel. In South America, you get uh, down to 85, and also they put a lot of... Um, ethanol. Ethanol in it, yes. And that's a real issue, a, a real issue, and it actually affects the performance of the car quite a bit. Like, they can have up to... Pardon? What was the price of fuel? Uh, price of fuel was cheap. It wasn't a big issue with the price. It was more the quality. You'd have to be very, very careful about, and particularly the uh, the fuel that they put a lot of the uh, you know that that ethanol in, which um, would um, uh, become like gelatinous after a while. It uh, you know when, when you got it out, if it started to evaporate, there's, it's like a jelly, almost like a gelatin that comes in. And you get that stuck in your car, base, you're you're really stuffed. Um, this is just an example of one of the racetracks, which was at a high altitude place up in the Atacama Desert. Uh, we'd drive in like it could be early in the morning, late in the afternoon, a three or four um, uh, a kilometre track, um, like a, a V8 supercars track. Every time I went there, I would throw everything out of the car I could. So I'd throw the tyres, you know, you had to take two spare tyres spare parts, all your kit, I'd always throw it out, including my wife. <laughs> and then I'd do the uh, race to the track to get the best time I could. And the car was very competitive. Like there were, uh, I think in my class, there were maybe four uh, 911 Porsches, which were normally the fastest cars. And I, I could keep up with the 911. Didn't really uh, beat them in terms of time, but got very close to their times, like towards the end around the track. At the beginning, uh, that wasn't so good, but towards the end when I started to learn a little bit more about the car and um, you know, how to be competitive, uh, we, were, we were pretty competitive in, in a 404. No worries at all. Um, oh, this is Machu Picchu, um, where we, we went, which was uh, Cusco. We, you know, um, you know, very scenic, well worth uh, 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 doing. The rally would, normally we would run like for four or five days straight, and then we may have a day off. 
Um, and we had a day off in Cusco, um, and therefore we were able to catch a, a bus or a train up to Machu Picchu and see Machu Picchu for the day, which was, was great. So that's Machu Picchu, which is actually in, um, in Peru. This place here, uh, which is in Argentina, is called Bariloche. And again, this is in the Andes, huge um, uh, lakes, which is uh, covered in beautiful um, uh, pine forests. Um, uh, I think there were three or four breweries, uh, gin distilleries. Um, it was like uh, any other, you know, uh, a really top-notch tourist resort you could want for anywhere in the world. And again, highly recommend that. Um, this scene down here actually is in the Atacama Desert, which again is, I think, 4,000 high altitude uh, deserts and very unusual vol volcanoes and scenes we could see from our, our mud hut hotel that we're staying in. And uh, these guys here are uh, obviously South American um, and uh, musicians, which, which we saw quite a bit you know, during our journey. Now the rally results. Um, the attrition rate, uh, there were about uh, 64 cars started and 48 cars finished. So there's quite not every day a car would, would fall out normally. Um, and the way the rally worked is um, people that, that once your car, uh, they could no longer, the actually rally organisation had four support vehicles, um, like Hiluxes if you like, with mechanics in each car that were normally very, very good mechanics, like good field mechanics. They would do their best to repair your car. You had to help them, you, so you yourself...